is researching family history. So, as I said, we're going to be looking at researching family history and, and in particular taking a look at online resources because um, the last year or so has certainly demonstrated that um, sometimes it may not be possible to visit the library or the archive service. And um, the wonderful thing about Heritage Week, which we're celebrating this week, is it's a great opportunity for us to kind of share um, some of the resources that we have um, in available to people and um, give them an opportunity to find some of those resources um, as well. So that's what we're trying to do here um, this morning or this afternoon. So to have a look at some of the records that are available, um, we're going to talk to, um, about civil registration, which is births, deaths and marriages, um, the church records, the baptism and marriage records, uh, census records, the 1901 and 1911, and I'll tell you a little bit of what, about why it is 1901 and 1911 only, electoral records, property records, estate records, and some of the records of professions. Um, so that's what we'll be having a look at today. Um, the first thing to say is when you're starting a family history search, it's a really good idea to take a look at what you might have yourself already. In some families, they're really good at keeping um, maybe an old biscuit tin with um, copies of um, birth, birth certificates, baptism or marriage records, confirmation certificates, um, photographs, little newspaper articles with birth announcements, things like that. So it's a good idea before you even get started to take a look at what you have available so that you have as much information to hand as you can get. And as part of that, it's also a really good idea to ask your extended family members um, what information they have and pool the information that you have together um, just to give you every opportunity you can get to make sure that you're starting from, um, from a good place in terms of the amount of information that you have. In a lot of cases families have the stories of the family and um, it's a good idea to gather this information while you can. One of the most common um, things I hear in the archive is people just bemoaning the fact that they didn't take the opportunity to talk to an elderly relative while they had it and when they were younger they might not have been as interested. So while you have the opportunity do talk to your family and squeeze them for every last bit of information that you can. And as I said, take a look at all of the, of the records that you have, try and pull out as much and um, as many dates and as much information that you can from them so that you can use that to follow um, when you're starting your um, search in the records themselves. So when you're doing a search in the records, there's a couple of pieces of information that you definitely require. First, of course, is the family names that you're interested um, and um, in terms of the personal names, one of the practices in Ireland was that the first names were often repeated through the family, and you can often tra trace the generations through the use of the names. So first sons were named after the father's father, and second sons after the mother's father, and the first daughter after the mother's mother, and so on and so forth. So um, it can be a handy guide to kind of making sure you have the right family if you're, you're finding the right Johns or Patricks in, um, in the sequence that you, you'd be expecting them. But what can sometimes happen is when a family divides, you know, in the same area, it can be a little bit confusing because there's two branches, but they are using the similar sequence because they're both referring back to the same great grandfather. But it is it can be a little bit helpful you know, to distinguish which is between, say, one power family and another power family in an area. However, the most important one is the one I put in the middle. Um, this is very, and, I, and I've pointed it out in my text here to say this is very, very important, the townland or the street name. This is because all of the official records are organized not by the personal names, but the, by the place names. So if you're looking for a family by the name of Power or Walsh or Purcell or Hogan, these are all really common names, um, particularly if you're in Waterford, um, certain areas of the county, uh, it'll be, this is known as Power County. So you'll find lots of powers and there's certain parts of the county where you'll find lots of Walshes or Welshes, depending on the branch of the family and the pronunciation that you're going to use. So the townland name is incredibly important to one to identify that you have the right power family or the right Walsh family. But the other thing, as I said, is all of the records are organized by place name. This is largely because records are not created in order for us to research family history. They're usually created uh, because of land. And in Ireland, land was paramount. The ownership, the occupation, the access to having the bit of land was absolutely vital. So um, most of our records are organised and are created because of land and claimants and claims to land. In terms of dates, you don't have to be accurate in your date range, but it can be helpful 
for you to know generally when the family might have left the area so that you're not actually looking for the family 50 years after they're gone from the area. It's not vital, but it can just um, it can save you from a little bit of searching. Now, as I said, coming back again to the family names, spellings can vary. For example, if you look at a surname like Mar, you can see it's there as M-A-H-E-R, M-E-A-G-H-E-R, M-A-G-H-E-R. Coming back to our Welshes, you have Walsh, W-A-L-S-H, W-E-L-S-H, W-E-L-C-H. You also have the Irish for Walsh, which is Brennock, and you also have the Anglicization of that Irish, which is Brunnock or Brennock. So all of those can actually be the same family and the same surname with different branches going for different spellings. So when you're doing a search, it's important not to get too caught up in the spelling that your family sort of stuck with later on, because one of the things that um, is in terms of the records is in a lot of cases, um, people weren't literate themselves and certainly they weren't in control of the record. So the record was usually written by somebody else who was hearing the name. So they are hearing and spelling what they what they heard and the spelling that they choose um, is determined by their own um, inclination and also by how good they are with the local accent. And the reason I say how good they are with the local accent is in a lot of cases, you're talking about um, official records um, being created sometimes by um, people who are coming from, um, from the UK, from Britain to be sort of the official um, registrar uh, or record keeper in a lot of cases. And they are not familiar with the accent. And um, I, if you know a good Waterford accent, sometimes um, if you go deep into West Waterford, it can present some difficulties. We actually have a lovely collection of um, pay records from a gardener who was um, coming in the Lismore estate. And um, it's, it's actually, it's very clear in his earlier records, he had no idea what some of the men were telling him their names were. And it's only as he cuts to that, he gets used to the accents later on that he figures out um, a lot of them were Fitzgeralds. <laughs> but his, his uh, attempts at what they were saying is, uh, can actually be quite funny. You also need to be very sceptical about the uses of the prefixes, the, the Irish language prefixes. So um, when you're looking for O'Brien's, make sure to try the Brian or the other spelling Brian. And for McCarthy's, try Carthy, Carty with a Y and Carty with an IE. Again, um, this is because um, Irish Irish speakers lost the um, the being able to put in their O's and Macs um, after the 17th century. And then in the late 19th century, as part of the Gaelic revival, a lot of people um, um, started adding it to their um, to their name um, as part of their interest in um, Irish history and Irish, co Irish culture, um, but not every member of the family did. So you start having this differentiation within the family itself where one sibling might be O'Donovan and the other one is, a, is Donovan. So uh, don't get too caught up in whether or not there, there will be an O or an Mac there. Try it both ways. So as I said, one of the most fundamental things to keep bear in mind when you're doing any family history research is the place name or the townland. So townland is the sort of the smallest um, denomination. So you've got your sort of 32 counties in the country and within each county there were baronies, within each baronies there are civil parishes and within each parish then you have the townland. So it's the smallest official designation. And um, you can see there, I've picked Ballycudra, and the barony there is Galtier, the civil parish is St. John's Without, and the Catholic parish is St. John's. So civil parishes um, were actually a reflection of um, what would have been the Church of Ireland parishes or the official um, um, recognised church parishes around at a particular point in time in the early sort of late 18th, early um, yeah, late 18th century. Um, but they later, the later Church of Ireland parishes don't correspond with the civil parishes. So in Ireland, you have civil parishes, which are the sort of official um, records. You have your Church of Ireland parishes and you then have your Catholic parishes. So there's a number of parishes to bear in mind. However, once you have the townland name itself, you can find all of the rest of the information. And the place to go for that is a website called loganum.ie. And they also have a wonderful resource where you can actually look at their arch scanned archival records. And um, that gives you the information from the place names branch into the history and the development of that place name from some of its earlier iterations to what we would recognize today. So you must have the townland name. And it's a good idea to check that you have the right townland. Um, 
in particular, if you're from Ireland itself and you know the physical location, it's a good idea to go into the map and just have a look at the townland boundaries. Um, cities and towns have expanded. And so locally, we might know the area by the housing estate name that's um, a little bit later rather than the townland name. And again, if you're looking at the records, they won't be look organized by the housing estate name, they'll be organized by the townland name. Also in rural areas, people start to use the nearest um, local post office sort of as a broader, um, definite a broader name for the area and and stop in some cases using the townland name so again if you know if you know the location double check the map there's a reason i picked balikudra as our example here and that's because if we take a look at um, the ordnance survey map um, this is actually balikudra in here this little thing here and this yellow bit is actually waterford city so um this is the 1842 ordnance survey map and actually the city has expanded quite dramatically. Um, and I think if you were in the city, you probably, um, if you're not familiar with the townlands, wouldn't necessarily know that technically you're in Ballycoudra. Um, you'll be using the street name and I think you might be saying you're in, um, heading up towards the workhouse, you might be saying you're in, saying, um, heading towards Grange, you might be saying um, Holbury, that direction. So Ballycoudry might not be the thing that you think of. So that's why it's a really good idea to look at the Ordnance Survey maps. And the Ordnance Survey make their historical maps available for free online. It's a really fabulous resource. Um, you have to go into www.osi.ie. Then um, it's slightly more complicated in that you have to go into professional mapping and then products, and then you'll find a list alphabetically of the different types of mapping. And the one you're looking for is called historical data. And when you click on that, um, it gives you this um, fabulous collection of maps. You can see the 1842 uh, original maps and the um, later 18. 18, sorry, 1920s one. And also you can see um, some of the aerial photographs, more recent ones as well, and the current, what they call the GeoHive map as well. So it's a really good way. And you can move between um, with the, the wonders of modern technology, you can actually overlay um, the current GeoHive map on, um, on the older 1840s maps. So you can sort of get an idea of where things are nowadays versus the 1840s version of the map or the early 1920s version of the map. Um, so in some cases, those are, or surveyed in the 1880s. Um, the 1842 um, Ordnance Survey maps uh, are absolutely wonderful. They are, if you are, if there's ever a query about the accuracy of the map, uh, of, um, a, of a map, this one will be the, the absolute accurate one. And um, there's some, if you're interested, there's some really good publications um, on the history of the Ordnance Survey and the work that they did in Ireland um, in coming up with new ways of surveying and measuring. Um, and maybe Tracy or, or um, Debbie or somebody from the library might be able to give you the name. It just escapes me. I think if, it, if it's called If Maps Could Speak, um, is the name of the book. But if you're interested in mapping, that's a really good book to take a look at because the Ordnance Survey maps are amazing and well, we're a fabulous, fabulous resource. So the other thing to bear in mind is that there may be one, more than one townland of the same name. Sometimes um, we can get a little, we can wax a little bit lyrical about our um, place names and our fabulous place names in Ireland. And we have some fabulous place names. Um, but also, at other times, we are not quite so um, poetic and lyrical in our place names. And here's a demonstration um, of, um, of new towns uh, in, in Waterford. And as you can see, there are a lot of them. Um, some of them are electoral districts, but a lot of them are actually townlands. There's quite a significant number of new towns, not just in Waterford, but across the whole country in, um, in Ireland. Um, and even if you look um, in, um, it can come up in other ways, Villiers Town in Irish is on Ballyanua, the new town. So um, sometimes you, you'll find the same townland name and there's different locations. So again, that's why the maps are really, really important to bear in mind as well. If you're not familiar with whether um, physically where they're located, it does mean that you have to check the records for one of the new towns. And if there's no sign of your family, then um, you know that there's another new town or at least another few new towns for you to take a look at as well. It does extend your research, but at least you know um, to, not to stop if you don't find them in one of the new towns or one of the addresses or one of the other um, place names. So we're taking a look now at civil registration, um, the records of births, deaths and marriages. So the General Registrar's Office is located in Roscommon, but there's a research room that's in Dublin. Um, again, at the moment, they're not open as far as I'm aware, 
but there is a fabulous um, website called irishgenealogy.ie, which has been made available by the um, department, um, the department of, it's, oh, now is it the Department of Tourism? I forgot what the, the current iteration of it is, but um, it's certainly the Irish government has made available the, um, the birth deaths and marriage records on irishgenealogy.ie. In addition to the civil records, there's also some Church of Ireland records and some Catholic Church records that they're working on, but that's that's been a bit of a slow process. And um, if you're looking for some uh, a, a certificate that sort of falls out outside of the range of dates, you can also apply for your certificate certificate online um, on the website www.certificates.ie. However, because of um, data protection, you need to have all of the personal information, the names, the dates and the information in order to make that order. The earlier ones are available. So in relation to civil registration, um, civil registration began, um, in, well, attempts to introduce civil registration began in 1845, and there were some Church of Ireland registrations from 1845. Initially, the Catholic Church were incredibly resistant to it, and they felt it was an attempt by the state to take away uh, an important role that they were fulfilling, and so they were very much against it. But after much negotiation, a mere not quite 20 years, um, they it, it was eventually um, it was eventually agreed that um, the Catholic Church would also um, comply with civil registration requirements. So that's when civil registrations um, actually began in Ireland. It's in 1864. So if you're looking for ancestors who were born, who died or who were married um, before 1864, then civil registration will not be the resource for you. The ones that are available online on irishgenealogy.ie, um, births are available from 1864 to 1920. Um, they stop in 1920 because of the um, data protection. So they won't be available after that um, because you need to, it's personal information. Um, deaths are available from 1845 to 1945. No, have I got the wrong way around? I might do. Um, the 1845, there's a little caveat on that in that, um, they, it, as I said, this is a, a little bit to do with whether or not they were being um, they were being used, and in some cases they um, they wouldn't have been used by the vast majority of people. And again, marriages from 1871. The caveat on that is just that they, if you do search for them, you may find them, but the actual link to the image isn't there, and they are working on adding the earlier ones um, from 1864 to 1871. So it may be there. Um, it just it just um, it might be missing at the moment, but they are working on adding back to 1864. Now the important thing with civil records is you need to squeeze every single bit of information you can out of these records and there can be a lot more than sometimes you can realize when you look at them. So if we take one as an example, this is a marriage um, record from 1884 and you can see um, Michael Cullen and both, in both cases they don't give the actual age they just say full age they're they're legally um, um, able to marry but if you see here you'll notice that um, Michael is actually identified as a widower, a widower so straight away you know that he's been married previously so you can go back and check your records and see, um, see is there another marriage that he had and um, check then the death records for his wife. Um, they also give his rank or profession. So in this case, he's a farmer. Um, farmer is means that he has land. Um, very important if you're getting married at that stage, um, that he had the bit of land. And you can see that the town land given there at the time of his marriage is Lakandara. As he's a farmer, then more than likely that is where the farm is. And you'll notice um, he, his father's name is given again, another Michael. And very importantly, they've also pointed out that he's deceased. And usually, not always, but usually the registrar will actually indicate whether the father is deceased. So that, again, is a very important piece of information, because if you're going back doing another search, it lets you know if you're looking for the death of Michael Cullinan, he has died um, by August 1884. So you're searching between 1864 and 1884. And again, you can see he's a farmer. So um, more than likely, Michael has inherited the farm from Lacandara. And Mary Walsh here, again, she's full age, she's a spinster, she hasn't been married before. She's also a farmer, so she's coming from land as well. You can see there, Cool and Smear, and her father, it's John Walsh, also deceased and also a farmer. So there, there, there are two farming families that are getting together. You'll note 
that their mothers are not recorded. Again, it comes back to that thing about land, I'm afraid. So the fathers are recorded, the mothers are not included. And it's also the father's status that is giving the status, if you like, to the son or daughter. So um, both of them are coming from farming land. Um, if the father is a labourer, um, th that again is sort of indicates, um, it indicates if, if he, if she was the daughter of a labourer, then she's marrying up and it's harder to kind of make those marriages work um, because usually um, in that kind of marriage uh, there, she's either bringing a bit of land or she's bringing some um, resources uh, into it. So marriage is not necessarily, um, it's not the, it's not necessarily a romantic thing always, although it can be, but also it's about joining families and um, about families being able to survive and um, thrive. And that means uh, bringing the bit of land or the bit of money or the profession or the rank. So those are all, all very important pieces of information that can be included in the um, in the marriage record and you can see there that they got married in the church in Colligan and also what can be very useful is to bear in mind who was witnessing the marriages because sometimes they're an indication um in this case um the the, the it's Michael Cullen and um so it's James Cullen and Joanna Carroll so that Joanna Carroll may be indicating um a, a family connection so it can be a, a, an important little piece of information to bear in mind when you're continuing your search so aside from the civil records, you, there's also the um, Catholic records of um, baptism and marriage. Now, baptismal marriage records usually start in the 1820s in particular. There's a very specific reason for that. Um, obviously, when um, sort of in the 17th and 18th century, it was not possible to practice Catholicism freely because the Church of Ireland or the Protestant Church was the officially recognized state church. So that's why you have things like mass rocks and people were secretly um, practicing their religion. As a result, it's not a good idea then for a priest to have a written record of who's secretly practicing a religion that's not actually being recognized. And um, particularly in the 17th century, there would have been things like priest hunting. And those are things happening across the land so very dangerous time to have a record of who was actually Catholic however by the latter part of the 18th century that's not happening anymore there's a there's a relaxation of that there's a recognition by the state authorities that um, you know to that uh, sort of to a certain extent of their freedom to practice religion so what you find is that it takes a while then for people to feel that safety and also then it takes a while for them to get together to be able to actually have a church. And so it's not until that there's a physical church where the records can be held that you find there's records existing and therefore in places in cities and towns it happens a little bit earlier so you'll see in Waterford and Ballybricken um, their um, baptismal records are starting in 1797 and um, St John's 1706 in Dungarvan 1787 so in some of the kind of urbanized areas they'll start a bit later for a lot of the more rural areas it's usually a little bit later often around as I said the 1820s again that's a sort of indication of um, Catholic Catholics being freer to kind of um, do better in society to make a little bit more money and then they can contribute to things like collections um, for the um, for the building of a new church and once you have a new church then you have a priest who can, has a place to put the records so it's a very practical reason as to why we don't have um, parish records um, up until a, quite a, you know quite a later date. So the local Catholic clergy maintain these records and the quality and the legibility vary. They Latinize the name. I say Latinized um, um, because in some cases, some of them weren't great at their Latin. So they kind of use makey uppy Latin names. <laughs> um, and it's only the first name that's Latin, uh, that's given in Latin and the surname is, is given in English. Um, the and also as I said the quality and eligibility vary depending on the um the, the, the sort of the the uh, access to, to ink and the the, the quality of the, the priest's handwriting. So the National Library of Ireland holds microfilm copies of these records and they've made them available on their website. So if we take a look at one of them here, this is from Dungarvan in 1787. Um, it's from March. 
and you can see the priest here, as I say, because they're individual to each, pre each priest, in the early years in particular, there's lots of different odd shaped, different sized notebooks, different types of pen, different ink. Some of them get very um, hard to see because obviously the priest is watering down the ink. So he's running out of money and he's spreading out the ink a little bit further. Um, and it's only later that you get um, sort of in the 1880s onwards where you get these specific columns and more um, standardized books. So at this point, you also have um, and this particular priest what he's done is, you can see this here is, um, he's shortened it. It's, it's Johann so for John, and he's got this um, F here. So he, again, he's, he's obviously a big fan of shortening out his records. Um, often you have what looks like an F and L, and it's Phileas or Philia Legitimus. So Phileas for son, Philia for daughter. Um, you'll also sometimes see Phileas or Phileas, Philia Illegitimus as in an illegitimate child. And so you can see that John is the son of another John here, but you can see he's got his little dot, so he's shortening it out. He's not, he's not writing it in full. And then underlined here is the surname Driscoll. So he's John, son of John Driscoll. And this little line here is ET for and. So son of John Driscoll, eh, Ellen, and again, he's shortened it, um, Ellen Neal. And the patrony or the, the godparents, again, he's shortening it out. So he's got his little shorthand, John Mahoney and M-A-R, um, which could either be Maria or Margaret. Um, unfortunately, in this instance, his shortening <laughs> has made it a little bit harder to guess. I'm thinking it's more likely to be Maria because he probably will put up, have put in the G for Margaret. And again, she's um, she's Kelly. So you can see the um, baptismal records when um, from the church can be a little bit more uh, difficult to decipher. And they do excuse me, require a little bit more work. But there are um, online services like Find My Past where somebody has done that work already. And if you subscribe to those services, you can actually just do a search by name and hopefully bring them up. But of course, that does lead to the danger of whether or not they've actually interpreted um, the, the, the idiosyncrasies of the individual priest in terms of their spellings or their um, the use of the, the names correctly. So it can be a good idea maybe to do your first search if you have a subscription to something like Find My Past and then and just double check the original record just to confirm um, the information that's there. So the Church of Ireland records um, also have their checkered history in Ireland um, and the church, the starting date for a lot of the Church of Ireland baptismal and marriage record can begin much earlier in the case of Christ Church in Waterford, it's 1655. However, because it was the official state church, um, they were required to deposit the records in the then public record office prior to 1922. The reason I put down 1922, of course, is that um, as a result of the um, destruction of the public record office at that point in time, the very obedient um, priests um, in the Church of Ireland who had deposited their records in that office um, that resulted then in the, in the destruction of those records. Luckily enough, not all of the priests were that, um, that obedient or indeed that timely. So a lot of them were slow to be sending them in and um, we're very fortunate that they were. So there are a set of, there are some records that are available and the um, representative church body um, in their Anglican records project have been working on making those records um, available online, but also they very helpfully have created a PDF um, indicating what records there are and um, what survive. Um, the National Archives holds some of the records as well. And in some parishes, you'll find the records. So this colour code um, was created by the representative church body to show where some of the records were. So you can see some of them are in the representative church body library in Churchtown, Dublin. Some of them are in the public records office in Northern Ireland. Some of them were lost in 1922, but they've managed to locate some other bits and pieces. Um, and so that's where you've got your green. Some of them are completely lost. Some of them were in what was the public record office in Ireland and were um, later found in the National Archives. And so we have um, they're, they're there in the National Archives. So this PDF is a really good resource if you're looking for um, church of Ireland um, baptism and marriage records. We move on now to the census returns. Unfortunately, again, as a result of the destruction of the public record office um, in 1922, there are only two complete surviving returns for Ireland. So um, in 1901 and 1911, and these are available online and searchable from the National Archives. It's census.nationalarchives.ie. Again, Going back to my earlier point, you need to use every single piece of information that they provide 
pull out everything you can feel um, you can get in terms of their ages, the occupations, the place of birth. So if we take a look, here's um, uh, just a record in Bally Macabre, and you can see you've got Edmund Nugent, and he's the head of the family. He's Roman Catholic. He's giving his age here as 51, and he's a farmer who's married, and he's originally from County. He was born in County Waterford. He has Irish and English. Again, it's, this piece of information can be useful because sometimes it can indicate that somebody was not from Waterford, was somewhere else, so it gives you another place if you're trying to track down the family. It get, um, the, the census gives the relationship of each person to the head of the family. So you can see his wife, Margaret, is listed, um, his son, Edward, and um, their daughter is also listed. And the son and daughter are 16 and 15, and they're listed as farmer's son, and the daughter is still in school. And they also have a domestic servant. This would not have been unusual at the time. Nearly every farm, even quite a small farm, would have had a domestic servant. Um, but you can see here, I don't know if it's very clear in the, um, from the screen, but you can all you can see that he's actually Ed, I think he's actually signed it himself. So he's literate. Um, in 1911, this is the same family, and you can see that. Um, uh, there's additional piece of information that's very useful. So in the additional piece of information, they've indicated that they've been married, they've asking people how long they've been married. So they've been married for 28 years. This is a useful piece of information when we go back to our Irish genealogy.ie website looking for a marriage certificate, because it tells us the date, the year um, that they would have been married using the 28 years information from the 1911 census. In 1911, the other thing that they were concerned about was they were trying to get a handle on the infant mortality rate which was incredibly high in Ireland at the time so one of the things they were asking people were how many children had they and how many children were still living and this is actually um, a sad but incredibly useful piece of information and you can see in this particular family they had six children but only three of them were still living and um, so it's a again it's a very useful piece of information but because it brings you back to your civil records to check for the death records for the other three children. Um, it gives you another source of information. Now you'll see their family has expanded as well because there are two nephews, um, um, two other Nugents living in the um, and they're listed as scholars. It's not an unusual situation. It doesn't necessarily mean um, they're Nugents, so they're obviously related to Edmund himself. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're orphans coming to live with the family. It could be a reflection of a very common practice at the time where they, that their family may have been more rural and this family are actually living in Ballymacarbury town itself. So they may have come into town to live with the family while they go to school because it would, would have been too difficult to be traveling um, from further up um, possibly further up um, the hills in Benny McCarbury direction into town to get to get to school. So this would have been a very common practice. But what it does is it gives you a little line of inquiry into another um, another branch of the family and gives you two more children's names that you might not have found otherwise. When we look at electoral registers again, um, <laughs> In Ireland, there was an incredibly limited franchise. Um, you had a property of £10 in the counties, or you had to be 40 shilling freemen, uh, shorty, 40 shilling freeholders or freemen in the in the boroughs and the cities and urban areas. What that meant is that you had an incredibly um, small number of people who had a right to vote. And it's only um, until 1918 um, that we get universal suffrage. However, in 1918, you have to bear in mind that universal suffrage was at the age of 30 for women and 21 for men. So when you look at some of the electoral registers, you may be expecting to see um, some of the female members of the family and they're not there. And it might be not that they're, they're somewhere else away from the family, just that they haven't reached 30 um, yet. So there's these little bits of information can be very useful when you're looking through the records. So this is an example of the um, registration for 1923 in Kilmac Thomas. And you can see the, um, the information there. Um, so it's, it's not, it, it just gives you the, the name of the person and the townland um, that they're in. So it's, it, it just really is kind of an indication um, that they're still living in a location. Unfortunately, um, we have very um, mixed um, survival rates in terms of our electoral re uh, registers. So um, I think after this 1923 one, the next one I have is 1946. So they're very big gaps. Um, the electoral registers, um, so we, you can, you can come in to view these um, 
because they were public records, but um, we can't actually digitize them yet because it would be a breach of data protection. So um, at the moment, um, it's possible to view the hard copy, but it's not possible for us to do a searchable database. We will eventually um, when they reach the age that we can do that. But there are limitations in terms of data protection and other issues that sometimes mean we're not able to digitize some of the records. As I said, a lot of the records that are created are created because of property. And um, but it's because they were created, um, we have family history information. So some of the property records that we have are tied the platinum books and they go to the 1820s and 1830s. We have Griffith's valuation um, that would be from the 1840s and the valuation and rate books that continue on from Griffith's and then later on, uh, well, sort of earlier on the estate records. So we're going to take those um, bit by bit. The tie the platinum books, they were created as a result of a survey which was begun in 1823. So the purpose of this survey was to ascertain the tithe payment, payment to be paid by individual landowners to the Church of Ireland. Remember the Church of Ireland is the official state church, so a tithe of one tenth of the, of the harvest is due to the official state church. And originally um, they would take that as a tenth of the harvest, usually in grain, so there used to be sort of grain stores that the, the church had for the, 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 one, the, the one tenth or the tithe. So um, by the 19th century they thought, you know what would be handier? Cash. Cash would be so much handier than grain. So they began doing a survey to work out the different um, value, the, the valuation of the land to work out what the cash equivalent of one tithe, of the tithe would be. So they, what they did is they had the land that was first, second, third um, class land, and obviously the better quality land had a higher valuation, and that's how they worked out what, what would be owed. Um, they were incredibly unpopular in Ireland, as you can imagine, um, for a lot of people who are Catholic, the idea of paying a tithe to a church that they, they didn't follow and that they didn't attend was obviously hugely, um, hugely problematic, and um, it's one of the reasons that we had the tithe wars. Now, the surveys were carried out by different commissioners appointed to each parish, and as a result, the quality varies. Um, they predate the, the Ordnance Survey mapping, so the townland names can be a bit different. The Ordnance Survey, because it was such an incredibly um, detailed and immensely valuable survey, one of the, the effects it had is it sort of set in stone some of the townland names and boundaries and earlier things like tides and um, border guards and um, um, townlands kind of, they could change a little bit. Um, so one of the things that happened, say, in Waterford is there's an area of mountain called, that was called Schlieve Green. Um, um, in the tie the plotments and that has about 20 or 30 different townlands within it and they're taking that sleeve green identification for, uh, from the Villiers Stewart estate records. Um, some of the commissioners were um, we don't like to say it, but possibly a little bit lazy. And they kind of called into the largest local landowner and said, look, give us a general indication of your from your uh, rental books about who's where and we'll sort of copy that down. And that's excuse me, what some of them did. The tithe allotments, and whereas other ones did a really detailed survey and did quite a bit of work, so it varies from place to place. Now, the tithe allotments don't ex um, don't identify the exact plot. This is a bit maddening. So, for somewhere like Schlieve Green, it's very maddening because I can't tell you exactly what townland um, to connect it up with the later um, records um, because there's no map. So we're sort of giving a general area in some cases, but in other, for other families, because the townland is quite small and because the family are always there, you can very definitely connected to the later valuation record. It does provide the acreage and the quality of the land. So again, the acreage and the family name can connect us to the later records and they are available online from the National Archives. It's tithepartmentbooks.nationalarchives.ie. I'll give you a little look at one of them. This is the tithe department for Aglish in the parish of Lismore, 1834. And you can see they kind of give you the name of the occupier, the amount of acreage, the kind of quality. And then in this one, they're kind of giving you little observations about who owns it or what might have changed in terms of ownership. So they can be quite useful as resources. Again, there's a reason that I picked this Aglish. Um, this is not the Aglish that is um, that might be more well known um, on the on the River Blackwater, just near Villiers Town. This is actually Aglish further up near Lismore towards Tallow. And that's again what I, why I say, particularly um, if you're looking at family and you're not from Ireland, it's a good idea to double check your place names because there may be more than one, uh, one of that townland and you might be not finding them um, because you're looking in the, in the wrong um, Aglish. So it's just something to bear in mind. So Griffith's valuation, um, 
Again, another property valuation. This was undertaken between 1847 and 1864, and it was overseen by Richard Griffiths, who standardized the information. So unlike at the Tyler Plotmans, there's a standardized production across um, the, the whole um, the whole creation of these records and they also sort of ensured quite um, detailed and very good survey work and they had the benefit of being able to do it um, using the mapping that the Ordnance Survey had provided. So it was a, a really detailed and good record. The reason that these um, records were created Again, it comes back to taxes. Um, this is in order to determine the valuation of land. And from that valuation, it's two particular taxes. Um, one is the cess or county cess that was used to fund um, local services. And the other is the poor rate, which was used to fund the workhouses and other um, public health services. Um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with the curse in Ireland, a bad cess to you. Um, so as you can imagine, people weren't great, great fans of the cess tax. Um, and later on, after 1894 and 98, the um, county cess and the poor rate were combined into one, one new tax, which was rates. And so that's why you have valuation books and then later the rate books. The map to accompany it um, is really brilliant because it allows you then to identify the exact location and um, with the piece of information from the survey. It's available online at askaboutireland.ie and you just click into Griffith's valuation and you can search by place name or by the, by the townland name or by the family name. So this is the information that you get in Griffith's valuation. So you get a plot number here you get an occupier and you get an immediate lesser, a description of the property, the acreage, and then the valuation of the, la of the land and the buildings and then total valuation. And this is very useful because um, in a lot of cases, um, occupiers weren't recorded. And in some cases, this might be the first time you're seeing a family member recorded in the official records because um, they, they are, um, they just didn't tend to show. And sometimes in the tithe departments, as I said, they didn't do as detailed a job. So you might first, for the first time, be seeing your family listed here. You'll sometimes see, I don't see an example of it there, but um, you'll sometimes see, um, wait, I think there's a quick one here. So you can see that Michael Walsh is um, an occupier from um, the Marcus of Waterford, And then he in turn is leasing a house and yard to Bridget Payne and John Diggins. So um, you'll, you sometimes you'll see the fact that um, there's a, a tenant who's leasing from the main landowner and then in turn is leasing further to, um, to another occupier. So it what they have there is the occupier and the person they're directly renting from. Now, sometimes rather cruelly, you might have a family that was living there, but they're subletting from somebody here and they won't show up in the record. Um, and that's just uh, unfortunate um, in that it can happen sometimes that later on you find them showing up in the rate books and they might have been there earlier on, just that they were subletting and not showing up um, officially because they weren't the ones directly paying the, the cess and the poor rate. So this is a valuation map. So you can see it has the plots um, identified and it has the plot numbers. So it's a great resource for connecting the information from the valuation book directly into the map. So you can see exactly what piece of land the family were occupying. And as I said, you can see that, that's, that's, that information is in askaboutireland.ie. So um, the property rates were collected by um, the grand jury and then the grand jury um, was abolished under the 1898 Local Government Act and the county council was introduced instead. So ownership and occupation of the land and property throughout the county can be traced from Griffiths, um, which was published Waterford in 1851, up to the 1970s. And then I very kindly put in with gaps. And in some cases, those gaps can be huge. So in, um, in some cases we have, um, the next um, valuation book after 1851 we have is 1869. And then in 1875, um, rather than having a book each year, somebody got the fabulous idea that they'd have just one book and write in the changes. So 1875 into the 1890s, early 1900s, there's one book with changes kind of crossed out and written in. But unfortunately, they don't date the, um, the changes. So in, for those periods of time, you're saying sometime between 1875 and 1890s, there was a change in ownership or that, the you know, the change in family. So you're moving generations. If your family were in a farm or uh, in a house within the one area 
between that period, you can actually trace them um, the whole way along. Again, there's a gap in a lot of cases in the early 1900s. Sometimes there's a gap between that 1890s right up to 1935 and in other um, electoral districts, um, we can be lucky and there's an earlier one for 1912. So, it, and in the city, um, it's even more cruel in that there's a gap between Griffiths and the next rate book we have is 1906. But then afterwards, we're fairly continuous um, with, the, with the rates until rates were abolished. Um, as I said, the valuation books only record the name of the person who's paying county sets or rates. So um, if, you're, if you're subletting or if you're not paying your taxes, then um, the name is not recorded. Um, the it, Griffiths valuation is available online, but the later valuation books are not yet digitized. So that means you do have to um, call into us or the valuation office in Dublin um, will also holds those records as well. In some cases, they don't have the gaps that we do um, depending. So this is just an example of um, one of the, the books. You can see this is the village of Ruth Gormick for a later rate book and you can see what I mean about they cross out the name uh, cross out the old name put in the new name change the house change you know they, they add in all the changes as they go along so they can be a really valuable resource when you're researching family history that's the barony of upper third so we're moving on now to estate records the landed estates in Ireland um, were uh, fundamental importance to the economic, social, political and environmental development of a county. And from a family history perspective, they're very important because where they do survive, they can provide tenant records from much earlier dates. Because usually, uh, as you may have noticed, when we were looking at the records, we we're talking about the 19th century onwards. And particularly for small farmers, for tenants, for um, labourers, there's just no record of them um, prior to the 19th century because they're not land holding and they just don't show up. So the tenant um, rental books are one of the great resources for, um, for family history. Unfortunately, um, they don't often survive. Now, as I said, when we look at Griffith's valuation and the rate books, you'll see the name of the immediate lesser is usually the landowner. And you can check landestates.ie, which is a searchable database of landowners, and it gives some information on surviving records. And a lot of cases, um, a lot of land estate houses were actually burnt. Um, it's a part, some of them earlier um, in the 19th century, some of them as um, in the 1920s, so uh, 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 as part of the War of Independence. So um, in a lot of cases, records were um, a lot of those tenant records were destroyed. And in other cases, the family moved to English estates um, in, you know, in, from the 1880s when they start selling off the land um, right up, obviously, to the War of Independence. Um, there's another resource called IAR.ie, which has archive collections across Ireland. So that's another good um, way to check to see are there any land estate records surviving. They are scarce, but it is worth taking a look. Um, they can be held in local archive, as I said, we have some of the Lismore estate papers, we have um, Charnley and a couple of other different estate records here. They can be held in the National Archives, the National Library, or they can still be in private hands. As I mentioned, they can also be held in the UK because a lot of these estate families, the Irish lands were just part of their overall estate and their main seat was in England. And so when they sold off the land in Ireland, they took all their records and everything back to the main estate in England um, or Scotland or Wales or wherever they were. So um, similarly to IAR, there's a website, uh, a searchable um, website called archiveshub.au um, or even if you just put in um, searchable um, archives website UK, you, you should hopefully get that in, or you'll find the link in the national archives.gov.uk um, and that might be your easier way to get it. So estate records can include, as I said, rental books, tenant application books. The Lismore estate is actually a very well run estate and they have tenant application books where tenants were looking for assistance to emigrate. They were looking for building materials to improve their holding. Um, they were looking for the estate manager to intervene where they were in conflict with their neighbours. So there can be huge information in those tenant application books. There's also correspondence, there's accounts and legal records. Um, things like the fixing of fair rents in the 1860s generated a huge number of records so they can be um, they can be available in the estate records excuse me now so we'll move on to records of professions unfortunately trades can be a bit difficult to track down because many of the trade societies that were there 
from the medieval period just didn't have their record survive and um, they're not available to research. But um, what is available in a number of local authorities and local counties are trade directories and you can find them in your local library. And here in Waterford, we've actually made some of them available and searchable online. I had a look yesterday, it's down. I will let IT know and we'll get it up again. It might be up since, just sometimes some of the links get broken and they have to be rechecked. So, um, but if you check on the, the on the council website under family history, um, there is, that you will find the trade directories. There are other professions that actually lead to records, things like the military, legal, medical profession, ships, captains, government bodies. So again, look at things like your census, your marriage records, things like that, to see if you can identify the profession and that will lead you to where you can actually go next. Now, this is a big plethora of links. And um, as I said, we will be recording this, so you, um, you will be able to get back into it again. So just to kind of give you um, a little snippet of um, some of the different uh, types of records that will be available for different professions. There's a register of general shipping and seamen available from the National Archives. And um, again, you can just go into the National Archives website and just search their catalogue and that'll bring you up to that um, registrar. It's from 1863 to 1921. The Royal Irish Constabulary, um, the police force in Ireland, again, that was a British controlled police force. So the records are actually with the National Archives in the UK. They have a research guide available on their website. Again, you can go into just their main website and um, you can, they have very good, very easily, easily now easy to navigate websites that will help you find um, the, the records. So you can just put in Royal Irish Cad, um, Constabulary. But you, you will also find findmypast.ie, that subscription service that I mentioned. They have made that um, searchable by name um, by working with the National Archives in the UK. So if you have that service, you can actually check um, those records. Again, there are some gaps in the records. There's, um, there's a couple of um, books written um, with indexes of the Royal Irish Constabulary officers you can have a check of that and just see if there's any mention of them there as well um, the British military um, again the National Archives in the UK if you take a look at their website they'll give you there's a whole different section of them they have them from 1913 they have first world war um, soldiers they have um, other other records as well so if you take a look at that um, anybody who has been um, following anything in relation to the decade of centenaries here in Ireland will be familiar with the military archives here in Ireland. They have been doing phenomenal work in making um, more and more information av available. And if you check their um, archive, militaryarchives.ie, they have a section in relation to gene genealogy and um, there's lots of information there as well. The reason I point out military, both in terms of Irish and British, one of the things the military does um, is it also lists dependents because they're one of the places where a pension is available and they list physical features so they can be a really good source of information because um they kind of give a little bit of information about if it's you know the the next of kin because they may have to contact the next of kin if they're if the member of the military um dies on, in service but the other thing um in, in particular both in terms of constabulary and the military is you don't get posted to where you're from so they kick they keep a record of where you're from originally to make sure that you're not serving locally. So none of the Royal Irish Constabulary members, if you're from Waterford, you didn't serve in Waterford just in case there would be a conflict of interest there. Um, Garda Tia Corner records, um, they again, the Garda have been working in more recent time well, um, for the last number of years um, in relation to getting their um, records um, more organized. There's um, some of the databases there, particularly um, about um, some of who, some of the service members are, who died in service, things like that. So again, if you contact, you can contact them if you're interested in researching a, a member of the family who might have been a Garda. You may have an, in, in Ireland a huge number of um, family members and it was considered a great honour if a family member was a member of a, re a religious congregation and joined a religious congregation. So this website here, churcharchives.ie, has a directory of all the archives of the different religious um, religious archives. Um, and that's a great way um, to try and track some of those down and see if you can find some of the family members there. So. Um, 
what about uh, not professionals? What if you're what if you're going to prison or you're heading to court? So the library service here in Waterford have um, some of the prison records and the court and jail records for Waterford available. They're available on microfilm at the moment. Um, they're not accessible. Um, just local studies isn't available at the moment, but it will be again soon. And uh, if you have any queries, um, Blaheen and the other library staff in, um, in Waterford will do their utmost to help you in the meantime. The prison registers are also available online from that subscription service, Find My Past, and possibly from Ancestry as well. Emigration. So uh, in our, in this, obviously Ireland had a huge amount of emigration, so there are lots of different records that you can pursue. Um, the Ireland Australia Transportation Database is available from the National Archives. It runs from 1788 to 1868, and um, it has records that have been taken from the court and other records and the shipping records in relation to those who were um, sent, uh, who were transported to Australia. Um, I mentioned there the tenant application books for the Lismore Estate. One of the projects that we did is we created a database of, um, uh, of tenants who were given assistance to emigrate to lots of different places, um, particularly um, they, in, in, in a huge number of cases, they went to various parts of America and to Australia and Canada and to other parts of England. At the moment, that's down. It was connected to a system that isn't operational anymore. So we're putting our heads together and trying to work out um, how to get that up in a different format. So it will be available again. But in the meantime, if you have any queries, send them in to me and I'll do my best to, to, to answer them. Um, in America, prior to Ellis Island, um, Castle Garden was the um, immigration centre in New York, and they have a searchable database that's free. Um, it's called castlegarden.org. And then, of course, Ellis Island itself has um, a searchable database. And um, sorry, now, excuse me. The um, Library and Archive in Canada probably easier just to go to the main library and archive website in Canada and take a look. Um, they have um, specific pages in relation to um, immigration um, from Ireland and some of the resources and different um, sources that are available. Waterford has a particular relationship with Newfoundland in Canada. So again, if you go to the Newfoundland archives there, you'll find more resources and information. There's actually a really good resource in Australia, the Trove Newspapers Online. Um, it's trove.nla.gov.au newspaper. Um, there's an awful lot uh, of um, this, this has newspapers and gazettes, and they often will have um, information, particularly when they're talking about deaths um, and where they say, uh, they might say sort of, um, John Walsh from um, Lismore County Waterford, originally from Lismore County Waterford, died. So it's a really good place to check um, before you come to, you know, before you're looking in Ireland, because in some cases um, they do actually give information. And in some of those death records, they actually say surviving him is his brother who's still in Lismore or his sister or, you know, that, that kind of information. So it can be use very, very useful. Newspaper records um, as, a, on a, as a whole are very useful, particularly um, uh, in relation to death notices and things like that. We have a lot of our newspapers available through the um, library website um, available online. So they're organized by date, so you do have to look through them. One thing to bear in mind is that they're not consistent, um, particularly in the very early years in the 19th century. Sometimes people who would have quite a significant status in Waterford um, won't have any death notice in the paper. Um, it seems to be at the whim of the editor at the time. So in some cases, you'll find lots of information and in other cases, not so much. Um, the Irish Newspaper Archive, again, is a wonderful resource. It's another subscription service and it gives you access to other newspapers um, throughout Ireland. And that is searchable and can be really, really useful. And the Irish Times Digital Archive is also there available as a searchable resource. We come on to burial records <laughs> and um, we have a number of burial records um, working between um, myself in the archive and the library service and um, you'll find them uh, under Waterford Council if you go into culture and heritage and just click on research family history you'll see we have grave inscript and a grave inscriptions database. This is using work that was carried out by um, community groups and also um, really brilliant individuals like Julian Walton who did a huge amount of work in the 80s taking um, uh, 
inscriptions from graveyards across the um, across Waterford city and county and lots of different communities like Tallow and various other places where they gathered up the information from headstones and recorded them and they're now that's now available as a searchable database and um, we also have a number of burial registers that were digitized um, from the archive so St Alfred's in the city, St Declan's in Ardmore, St Carthage's in Lismore, St Patrick's in Tremor and St Mary's Cemetery in Butterstown. St Mary's Cemetery in Butterstown was actually is not an official register it was um, again um, information that, that was sorry it is at a register but it was gathered by the community and um, it, it would be the other ones are council registers for what were council burial grounds and they um, they can be a little bit later because um, it's only when the council took them over in Waterford, we're also incredibly lucky that um, Thompson's funeral directors very kindly shared with the library their funeral books, um, which we, um, which they, which were digitised, and um, they're available up on the website there as well. And they, Thompson's would have been one of the um, fun, one of the biggest funeral directors in um, in Waterford City. There's also other resources like findagrave.com. What Find a Grave has are where somebody, again, it's similar to the earlier grave inscriptions, um, where somebody is visiting a graveyard and doing some research themselves. They kind of take images or information from other headstones um, so that they can help other people when they're in their quest to find information. So sometimes that can be useful because they may have, um, they may have visited a burial ground you're interested in. And again, when you're looking at the headstone, come back to making sure you can pull every piece of information that you can get from the headstone, the ages, the dates of the, uh, dates of the death, so you can go back if you can get a, a civil record of the death, all of those things. Um, in death records, you're looking to see who was the informant, what the relationship was to the, um, to the person who died. Every piece of information that you get, uh, squeeze it for every, you know, every bit that you can, because um, every little bit that you can can lead you to somewhere else. It's um, So it can be this kind of breadcrumb trail that can sometimes give you um, a whole host of information you weren't available weren't didn't realize was available there are um, some genealogy services available that uh, you know if you want if you're not in a position to do the research yourself the national archives has a list of genealogists as does the national library as i said there are subscription services like find my past and like ancestry and also there's a very good um, website called irish genealogy toolkit um, which uh, gives you a really useful guideline on how to what records are available and how to get started and so if you are starting out on this then that's a really good one to look at. In our own website, um, you'll see, um, if you go into waterfordcouncil.ie and click on services and click on culture, you'll see on the left-hand side, research family history. And that's where you'll find um, a lot of those resources that I refer to there, the trade directories, the death registers, the burial registers, things like that. They're all available there. There's also a publication that we did some years ago on researching your family history in Waterford County. And um, that was uh, quite a few years ago so at the moment we are updating and revising that so hopefully in the next year or so we'll have an updated um, publication again telling people how what resources are available and where to find them. So I hope you found that useful and if you have a question and um, as I said I'll take a look at the chat now and see if I can answer it and in the meantime if you don't want to put it in the chat but you do want me to have a check of something my email is archivist at waterfordcouncil.ie um, or you can give me a ring if it's too complicated to explain in an email and so hopefully that gives you the information to get started in your family history search.